turn please to John chapter 3 verse 16. Probably the most famous verse in all the Bible, but I want us to look at it in light of the Christmas season. Amen? Amen. Now I'm supposed to, according to Simon, tell a funny story. Okay? Children, I don't remember the year what it was, but my youngest daughter was so excited about Christmas, so she got all her gifts, I wrote them up, and lo and behold, there was one gift that even to this day we cannot figure out. It was a purple extension cord. Why it was in there, nobody knows, even to this day, all we checked with every family member, nobody knows who bought it or how it got under that tree. My guess is God said, we want to give you guys a new surprise. I don't know where we got a purple thing, so that's my funny story today, amen? And I think you guys can share that with Simon, he's got a gift for each and every one of you. Amen? Now I want to show you something I think is very important about John 3.16. If you know that, say it with me please. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Amen? Yes. Where is that found? John 3, 16. Join me in prayer, please. Father God, I pray by your Holy Spirit's enabling, as I handle your precious word right now, I might do so with simplicity, with accuracy, and most of all, with power. I cannot do that in and of myself. I quickly recognize that. For I believe, Spirit of God, if I will allow you to speak through me, great things will come forth today through this message. I just bless your holy name, Lord Jesus. Pray now that all that is said and done would bring glory to your name, I ask it in your name, Lord Jesus, and all God's people said, Amen. 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 Why Jesus? Why the birth of Jesus? As Pastor Tim introduced the Christmas series to us, I began asking the question, why did Jesus have to come to earth? Why was he born? And I came to a very simple conclusion, ladies and gentlemen. There are actually four reasons why Jesus came to be born. Now, if you think about the verse we just read, John 3, 16, or if you think about it in your mind right now, do you realize that every pertinent question about Jesus Christ is answered for us? What do I mean by that? Watch this. The Bible tells us about the who, the where, the when, the why, the how, why. the why. The Bible answers all those questions for us. So today for our communion meditation, what we're going to do is we're going to answer those for you. Number one is going to be, I want to give you this truth. I think that John 3.16 is one of the greatest paradoxes in all the Bible. Let me give you the definition of a paradox. Not a paradox, a paradox. A paradox is a logically self-contradictory statement or a statement that runs contrary to one's expectation. It is a statement that, despite apparently valid reasoning from true premises, leads to a seemingly self-contradictory or a logically unacceptable conclusion. Number two, paradox is a seemingly absurd or self-contradictory statement or proposition that when investigated or explained may prove to be well-founded or even true. Number three, a paradox is a statement or proposition that despite sound or apparently sound reasoning from acceptable premises leads to a conclusion that seems senseless, logically unacceptable, or self-contradictory. So what do I mean by this is the greatest paradox perhaps in the Bible? Watch this please. God created mankind, God put everything that we see around us into creation, the Bible says, and it was good. And then he brings man into the planet and says, and it was very good. Now watch this. It reflected God's perfection, God's beauty, God's mercy, God's grace, God's kindness, everything that God is was reflected in his very creation. Amen? Including man. So now we've got this perfect God creating this perfect environment, this perfect being, mankind, all of a sudden mankind says, but you know what? That's not good enough for us. We want to do our own thing. We want to do what we want to do, when we want to do it, and how we want to do it. And watch them, with whomever we want to do it. So now God has taken this perfect, or sin has taken this perfect being, this perfect creation, and now suddenly it is tarnished, isn't it? So what should be God's reaction at that point? Now think about how you or I would respond. You know what, you all have blown it. I gave you everything you needed, everything you wanted, you have all blown it. So you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna spank all of you. This kids is a funny story. For many years with the Alliance, I served as president of the Brazilian Association, which meant I oversaw all the Brazilian churches in the United States for the Alliance. 
And so my pastors were talking to my boss at headquarters in Colorado Springs, and they said, Pastor Sandy spanks us. <laughs> and my boss looked at me and he said, do you actually spank these guys? And I said, ask them what they mean by spanking. So what they meant was that when Pastor Sandy saw them acting out or saw them not doing their ministry properly, I would get after them and tell them we need to fix this. In their mind, I was spanking them. Now I was thinking about what I want to share with you, and the bottom line is, God could have said to mankind, I'm going to spank all of you. You all deserve it, so I'm just going to spank all of you. But he did not do that, did he? According to John 3.16, what did he do? And here comes the paradox. He gave his son for us. Now imagine, please, your children have acted out, your creation that was perfect is now tarnished by sin, it has fallen into this degraded state of sin, corruption, and everything else. How do you respond? You give your son for them. Your precious, priceless, perfect son, you give it for them. It's a paradox, isn't it? Yet we discover as we ask the question, why Jesus? Why this individual? We must answer those questions, the who, what, when, where, how, and why. So let's do that, shall we? First of all, let's start with the who. The who is found in Luke chapter 2, verse 11. We'll not take time today to look at all these references. Just write them in your notes, please, or in your mind. It was the long-awaited Messiah. Now this becomes very important for a specific reason. Now remember, when God created all things, the Bible says it was ex nihilo. The Hebrew phrase which simply means out of nothing. He spoke and there it was. So I'm holding my hand and I say, let there be a pineapple upside down cake, the greatest dessert ever created by man. <laughs> and suddenly it appears in my hand. That's what we call ex nihilo. So now it's time for the long awaited Messiah, the promise of God, and he says, you know what? We're not going to do it that way. We're going to do it a little different. I'm going to send my son, who will be born of a virgin, We're going to come through the seed of the woman. We're going to do it totally different. So the who is the long awaited Messiah that God had promised? So if the who is the long awaited Messiah, what then is the what? The what is the fulfillment of God's promise to us? Do you realize that John 3, chapter 15, beloved, is the first promise of God? God said to mankind, now, to mankind has fallen. Adam and Eve have fallen into sin. Do you remember the blame game? The woman says, God says, what have you guys done? Well, she did what he did and so forth. Do you realize that carries over to marriages today? You know, my marriage would be better if she if he, if whatever. So we got this plan game, and ultimately what it comes down to is, it's a very interesting dynamic, but Adam says to God, he says, you know what? It really, God, is all your fault. That woman you gave me. Can I tell you how many men have said to me over the years? You know, she was so beautiful, she was so adorable, she was so sweet back then, until... Now, when the Bible speaks of sin coming into the world, it talks about how everything was perfect until. So mark that little until there, okay? So Adam now begins to blame God for it. If he hadn't given me that woman, that woman that I wanted so desperately, that I just loved to pieces, she was so adorable, so sweet, look at her now. And it's your fault, God. So the who is the long-awaited Messiah? The what is the fulfilling of the first promise? Now, what do I mean by that as we leap to the table? God said to the man, he said, because you've done this, your work will be made much harder now by thorns and thistles. Imagine, guys, there were no, no weeds, no thorns or thistles prior to the sin. He said to the woman, ladies, tell me if this is still true. He said, in childbirth, there will be great pain. And all the women said, still true today, isn't it? I was in the hospital, my sister was giving birth to her child, first child, and I could hear, this was the days back when, before the dads could go in and all that stuff. Now I'm down the hallway from my sister having her baby, and I can hear her back then saying to her husband, when we get out of here, I'm gonna kill you, Gary. <laughs> you are a dead man. If you think our relationship will ever be the same, you are crazy as you can be. Amen. Now, let's be honest today. How many women have felt that way to a job? A few brave hands went out. But we find that God says then to 
uh, the serpent, he says, and here's the punishment I'm going to give to you. It's twofold. He said, number one, you're going to be down on your belly the rest of the days of your life, and the dust of the earth will be in your nostrils. Now watch this, and he said, I'm going to put an enemy between the woman's seed and you. That enemy is the first direct mention to Christ in all the Bible. So now God's promise is, I'm going to put this enemy between you and the devil, between you and the woman's seed, that was when Christ came and was born, though, there was the fulfillment of that first promise. So kids, when Simon asked you what the first promise was in the Bible, say when Christ was born. It was the fulfilling of Genesis 3.15. So we know the who, the long-awaited Messiah, not spoken and created by God ex nihilo, but rather coming through the seed of the woman. Secondly, the what is the first promise fulfilled by God in the, all the Bible. Number three, what about the when? The when says, and according to the Apostle Paul in Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4, he said, when the fullness of time had come, the woman brought forth her son. When the fullness of time. Maybe next year in my Sunday school class, we'll do a whole series of lessons on the fullness of time. There were certain events that took place at the birth of Christ that had never occurred before in human history and have never occurred since. Only at that moment in time when Christ was born. So Paul said to us, he said, the fullness of time. So now we answer the who, the what, the when. What about the where? Well, Micah the prophet said it would be in a city called Bethlehem. Are you aware, beloved, there were actually two Bethlehems in Israel? There was a northern Bethlehem, and there was a southern Bethlehem. Now notice how Micah the prophet said uh, Bethlehem of Judah, correct? He talks about the, the land and the region of Judah. Let me show you this. I wish we had a big map here. The northern, the northern Bethlehem is actually up here. It's just to the west of the Sea of Galilee. It is very near Nazareth, where they're, where they're located at the time. So they have to go from here down to the southern. So it's not the Bethlehem that's in the region of Zebulon, which is a different tribe. It's in the one of Judah, which is in the southern part. So now they've got to go south from up here if they had gone to the north one, below it is only about 10 miles. But the Bible tells us they had to go to David's birthplace, where King David was born. Guess where King David was born? In the southern Bethlehem, which is also in the region of Judah. So all this must be fulfilled according to God's plan, because that's what Micah had told them. He said, you don't watch for the baby being born up north. You watch for him down in the south here. So now we've got the who, what, when, the where, what about the how? Had to come through the seed of a woman. In Isaiah chapter 7, the great prophetic passage we study at Christmas, God said to Ahaz, he said, ask me for the most absurd, bizarre thing about how I'm going to make this happen. Ahab said, Ahaz says, I will not do that. But in verse 14 it says, but God said, let me tell you what, I'm going to give you the most absurd thing or bizarre thing. He said, you know that it's going to come through a woman, a virgin is going to give birth. Now I gave you the definition of, of a paradox, it is absurd, correct? Tell me how absurd it is for somebody to say there's going to be a baby born, but there'll be no conception that takes place here. There'll be no man involved, there'll be no union involved, and you know what I mean by biblical union, we're not going to say in front of the children. And he said there will be a baby born. He said, but not only that, he has, he says, this baby's going to be a male child. This baby will come through the virgin. Now watch, this piece it all together. In the southern Bethlehem in Israel, which also happens to be the birthplace of King David, because he's of the line and lineage of David. And one day this baby's going to sit on the throne of David. Amen. Amen? Amen. But notice how paradoxical all this is. This is, doesn't make a lot of sense, does it? So we still haven't answered the question yet, why? Why Jesus? Now I'm going to give you four things today, beloved, about why Jesus. Amen? Amen? Number one is, according to 1 John chapter 2, Jesus would be, <coughs> did Simon leave? He must have gone to the office to get coffee. <laughs> I, just, I need some water, please. Now watch this, in 1 John chapter 2 it says that Jesus would be the propitiation for our sins. That word propitiation appears four times in the New Testament. Here's what it means. To appease the wrath of God. 
So the first thing that Jesus did, beloved, when he was born, he appeased the wrath of God. Now you say, how do you know that, Pastor? Very simple. Tell me the gifts they brought him on that occasion to a newborn baby. Gold and myrrh. And what was myrrh? I forgot. You're going to have to tell me. It was embalming fluid. Now, if you know I have the most precious little grandson that maybe God ever put on planet Earth. Amen? So then get amens. But now watch this. I must confess to you, of all the gifts I've purchased for my grandson, not once have I thought about embalming fluid. Not once. Why embalming fluid or why preparation for the dead body? Because that baby was born for one reason. That baby was born to die. That baby was born to appease the wrath of God. Very simply stated. Now we know that too because when we go to the cross, what happens? Now watch this please. While Christ is hanging on the cross, God cannot look at him and earth does not want him. You're aware of that? He hangs there a lonely figure, isolated all by himself. He looks up at his father, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because the very millisecond he looks up to see the face of God, God is back, got his back turned to him. God's anger must be appeased. Yes, beloved, God does get angry at sin. So at that very moment in time, this baby is going to have all the sins of the world placed right upon his back. He's going to be the propitiation for our sins. Secondly, why Jesus? Because he would render powerless the enemy. In Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 and 15, it says this. And he took on our flesh, he became flesh, for what purpose? That he might render powerless the devil. You say, but the devil has no power over me. Oh, beloved, you're fooling yourself. You realize the devil knows what buttons to push with you? He knows when to push it, he knows how to push it. Yeah, but I'm stronger than that. Please, 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 please. How many of us have fallen prey to the devil, quite frankly? Every hand should go up in this place. Every hand. Including your pastor, I'll put two of them up. And Tom knows exactly why I need to confess my sin. Hey, Matt, Tom, I can't tell that story to the children. <laughs> I do want you to pray for Tom, though. He's got a little bit of a mean streak in him. <laughs> so the, the power of the devil over mankind had to be destroyed. And you know what the greatest power is? The power of death. You're going to die. But Jesus said, you know what? Death is a doorstep for you because he said, I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And that's why the great apostle said, you know what, beloved, he said, don't fret because be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 But the devil says, but you know what, I've got him held in my power. Jesus said, no, you don't. I've rendered you powerless. The third is because he had restored the broken fellowship. Now let me back up one before I get to that, because I want to spend a little time. Third, he had to destroy the works of the devil. How many of you like to fish? I know that Garth does, and Tom, and some others. Would the devil, would you, you ever go fishing without any bait? What have you caught, Garth, when you've not used any bait? Not caught, you caught nothing. Has anybody gone fishing without bait caught something? Anybody? What'd you catch? Beside the water. Snapping turtle? Were you fishing for a snapping turtle? <laughs> now watch this. Not only does the devil have the power to make it happen or did have, he knows what bait to use. I have a nephew that's a phenomenal fisherman. And that guy can catch fish anytime he goes. And my mother and I were, I were talking recently, and I said, Mom, the reason Stephen is so good is because he knows, now watch this, what bait to use for what fish? Amen? And I said, Stephen has studied fish. Now watch this. And he's all his life he's studied fish. So he knows that if he wants to go catch this fish, he's got to use this particular bait. You know the devil says, for this man over here, pornography will work great. We won't work on this guy over here, but this guy will. This guy over here needs power, he needs the ability to steal things. 
This guy over here needs drugs. This lady over here needs prestige. This lady over here needs her needs met. This lady over here needs. So the devil knows, beloved, what bait to use for what fish. And you're the fish. And I'm the fish. That's why not all of us struggle with the same things in our spiritual walk. Because that certain baits won't work with us. Amen? Amen. But the Bible says Jesus came to destroy that kind of the works of the devil. Notice it's works in the plural. Because one work won't work with all people. The fourth thing that God, Jesus came for, the why, is to restore fellowship. Paul uses a very important word there. He uses the word koinonia in the Greek. And here's what it means. It means to restore fellowship, union with, oneness with Jesus Christ. But there's an interesting thing about the word koinonia. It comes from the world of commercialism. And it literally means two people partnering together. When they partner together, it says they share responsibilities, they share tasks, they share duties, they share joys. So now think about this, please. Through that baby, Jesus Christ, God says, I put you out of the Garden of Eden. It literally means I have to run you out. But he said, you know what now? He said, through Christ, through this baby and his ultimate death, he said, I want to come back into a partnership with the moment, beloved, you confess your sin and you receive Jesus Christ, that fellowship, that partnership is restored right just like this. And it happens this way. You don't have to earn it. You don't have to deserve it. It's a gift of God for you. Remember we said the paradox is we went from enemies of God, outsiders of, of Israel and so forth, to children of God all in one swoop because of the person of Jesus Christ, this baby that was born on Christmas. We celebrate. Amen? Amen. So now, beloved, we enter the who, what, when, where, and why, and how. Amen? Amen. And it's all about Jesus Christ. Amen. Say it with me again. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believed in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now watch this, please. The greatest gift God will give to you, you're going to hold in your hand in just a moment. Symbolize it this way for right here. Amen? Amen? And the greatest source of destruction of the power of the devil, you're going to hold in this cup right here. Amen. Amen? Now in just a moment, when we begin to serve this, we're going to ask you to do something for us. We're going to ask you to hold that cup, and then we're going to look at one verse of Scripture. Amen? Amen? Now since the children are with us today, if you're over 10 years of age, you can close your ears now. Children, what this is, this is what we call the communion table of the Lord. It's a memorial feast for the person of Jesus Christ. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, I need either Simon or Jeff or Jesse. Jesse, you're my guy, right? Jesse reads for me every Sunday. Jesse, read for us 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Jesse. Let me find where I want you to start. to start Jesse in verse number 23. Go through the end of the chapter, please. Just as loudly as you can, Jesse. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed. Okay, stop there, please. Where did this teaching come from? Where I received from who? I received from the Lord. Beloved, the teaching I'm about to share with the children on the communion table comes directly from Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. It doesn't come from the Christian Mission Alliance, doesn't come from the Baptist, doesn't come from the Methodist, or the Presbyterians, or the Lutherans, or whoever. It comes from Jesus Christ. Amen. Now may I show you the ultimate love here? When did he give this teaching? Watch this. On the night he was betrayed. Imagine, please, the very... Emotionally, psychologically, the most difficult time in the life of Christ on planet Earth. What's he thinking about? He's thinking about us. On the night he was betrayed, he gave us this teaching. Go ahead, Jesse. You're doing a good job. The Lord Jesus, the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. 
this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner. Okay, don't rush here, Jesse. Now, notice, please, this is, we're doing this on behalf of Jesus Christ, correct? As a memorial service. So when we take that wafer in our hand, we say, Lord, I remember when you hung on that cross, bloody, broken, and bruised, that should have been me. Now, remember I said the word propitiation means to appease the wrath of God. Imagine if we went to someone and said, you're going to go to jail now. For what? Because your neighbor down the street was speeding and you got it. We're going to put you in jail. Why, well, we'd rise up in opposition, wouldn't we? You know what Jesus said? I love you so much, so I'm going to go ahead and do that for you. But he said, this way it represents my broken body. Children, this is not just a cracker weed. It represents the broken body and is being handled very, very carefully. Then he said to cup, the shed blood. The writer of Hebrews said it best when he said, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. There is no canceling out of the dead. You know what the bottom line is, beloved? Somebody is going to pay for sin. Christ has already paid for it, so we can either accept his payment, or we can say, you know what, I'll pay for it myself. Can I give you something in love? You don't want to make that decision, you'll pay for it yourself. Accept Christ's payment for it. Now notice he tells us all the blessings of the table. Now listen to the warning, please. So then, whoever eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. That is why many among you are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep. But if we were more discerning with regard to ourselves, we would not come under such judgment. Nevertheless, when we are judged in this way by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will not be finally condemned in the world. So then, my brothers and sisters, when you gather to eat, you should all eat together. Anyone who is hungry should eat something at home, so that when you eat together, See, so it's not just a wafer and some juice, is it? He said it's much more than that. He said, if you're hungry, eat at home. Don't bring it to the table. This, he said, is something totally unique. Now, there's actually four views I thought about teaching on today on the green elements, what they are. I'll just briefly give them to you, and then we'll move on. One is called transubstantiation. This will be on the test later, okay? Transubstantiation, then there is consubstantiation, then there is Swingillianism, then there is what we call Memorial Feast. Swingillianism and Memorial Feast are very close together. In the Alliance, we do not believe that this becomes the body and blood of Christ, which is what transconsubstantiation means. Neither do we mean that it's consubstantiation, which means the body, this, while it remains the same, it is weaved in with the body and blood of Christ. What we believe in the Alliance is, it is a it is an element that represents something. It is a memorial to Jesus Christ. So that's why it has to be handled very, very carefully, beloved. So two questions. Number one, do you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? <coughs> Remember I said that over on this side, God had created a perfect man who was a reflection of a perfect God. What did that man say? That's not enough for me. I want more. Now, it's interesting because the Bible teaches us, beloved, that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Every single one of us. Amen. No exceptions. The Old Testament teaches the same message, but worded a little differently. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've all gone our own way. Every single one. So we got to deal with that sinfulness, don't we? Yeah, but I've been very good in life. Well, we thank the Lord that you've been very good. We still not need help. If you follow the news today, you know what the problem is in modern day America and the world, in fact? 
We don't measure ourselves by any absolutes. We have what we call a relative righteousness. If I'm better than Joe Smith, and if I'm better than Mike Jones, you know what, I'm a pretty good guy. God says, but I'm not measuring you by Ralph and Joe. I'm measuring you by my standard up here. When we do that, beloved, we must come to a final decision, a final point. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've all gone our own way. We've all sinned against the holiness of God. Can I give you a little indicator to know where you're at spiritually? When sinning against the holiness of God outweighs getting caught. Because what if you never get caught? You still have done it against the holiness of God. Is that true? If that's true, say amen. amen. If it's not true, say, Pastor, you're still a good guy. <laughs> amen. amen? So children, what we must do is we must first of all deal with the sin nature of our lives, the sinfulness of our lives, and we must ask Christ to come into our hearts to save us from our sin, to forgive us of all our sin. And the Bible says if you haven't done that, please do not come to the table. But then what to say further for those of us who have? Examine yourself. You know what I've discovered, beloved? Let an expert examine. Five years ago, it would be six years in April, I suffered a massive stroke. And so when I got the MRI of my brain, I thought, I'm going to look at this on the computer and I can see exactly what happened to me. So I downloaded all these CDs and looked at them and I thought, I don't see a thing wrong here. Went to the expert, the neurologist, put him up, and he said, look at this scar right here. Look at this over here. Now, you'd think I learned because many years ago, I injured my back, same thing, MRI, and I put it on my computer and looked at it, and I thought, I don't see anything at all wrong with my back. My back looks perfect. Took it to the orthopedic surgeon, and within two seconds, he said, look at this right here. He said, you're disc has ruptured in half and it has pinned your, your sciatic nerve to your spine. So that's why you can't walk. But I did not see that. You know he said to me in love, Pastor, he said, you're not an expert in backs. You are in the Bible, but not in backs. So here's what we have to do to fix that. Beloved, I've discovered that when we come to the communion table, let's let the expert examine us. So you've got to be very brave when you come to the communion table. Holy Spirit of God, you know my heart, you know my thoughts, you know my intent, you know everything about me. Would you please turn your spotlight on? Would you please examine it? Are you coming to the table perfect? You are. But you know that you are coming? You have an attitude of, I want to be as spotless, as pure this moment as I can possibly be. The Holy Spirit of God, you're going to have to show me that. You know what he may show us? That impatience we had in the shopping line this last week, where suddenly those thoughts came to my mind where, why is it always me, Lord, that gets behind these kind of people? <laughs> Incidentally, I'm confessing my sin now that happened to me this week. I said, Lord, it seems like no matter what line I get in, no matter what state I'm in or what country, I always get behind the slowest person. Now I watch this, it gets even worse. I always get behind a woman, press a dick to a purse for every coupon ever created. <laughs> which she can't find. She's got to try to download it on her computer. There's no internet in this place. Now, Lord, I'm standing behind her. Thank you so much. Now, let me go to the communion table and praise the Lord. <laughs> You're all laughing, but you know what? Some of you men have been there, haven't you? Yeah. Notice not the ladies because they're praising each other. Yes, yeah, sister, go ahead and look for her. Don't be quiet back there. Let her look for that coupon. Don't save me 10 cents. <laughs> Forgive me, Lord. <laughs> Amen? Amen? But we've got to be beloved. Now listen, we've got to turn on this, please. We've got to take this table very seriously. I've had the privilege of serving communion in many countries around the world. Far too often I've watched it just become a meal or a snack. This is far much more than a snack, isn't it? While we do not believe that this wine or this juice becomes the blood of Christ, yet there's something about that juice that is very special. Isn't it? When we take it in our hand, we recognize that's what set me free right there. There's something about it, I can't explain it, 
It's almost like baptism. People say, well, would the baptism change you? All this is water that's run into a pool. But you know what? When those bodies go down into that water, something happens, doesn't it? We'll let the Spirit of God sort all that out. All I know is there's something special about this. So I'm not only speaking to his children now. If you've never received Christ as your Savior, please let the elements pass you by. Because what was the warning, Jesse? We bring what upon ourselves? Judgment upon ourselves. Not discerning the body, the body and blood of Christ. That's how seriously God takes it, beloved. He said, that was my son right there. So when God looks down from heaven at these elements, he sees far more than just a cup of juice and a little wafer, a little cracker. Much more. Amen. 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 Elders, would you make your way, please, we might serve these dear folks in you. Now, who was supposed to give me the heads up on this quarter till 12? Who did I assign to do that day? Nobody. I'm going to pray that God gives us a giant clock back there. <laughs> Amen. Pastor Jeff, would you praise the Lord first of all for us and just thank him for his precious son? Let's just join Pastor Jeff in that. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you each day. We stand before this table and praise you and thank you that that perfect Amen. We're just going to ask you please to hold this element until all have been served and then we will partake together. Gentlemen, you may serve. Thank you so much. Wait for please and hold it in your hands. Please repeat after me. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. That you took my sin. You took it to the cross. Through your broken body. Now I am set free. Now as I partake of this wafer, a symbol of your body, I do so in remembrance of you, with praise, with thanksgiving, and rejoicing always. Amen. Let's partake together, shall we? Take this cup, please, and I want you to look right into that cup. Listen, please, to the Word of God. Revelation chapter 12. They overcame the devil by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. Amen? Amen. I'm going to give you a quiz now. I'm going to give you the answer at a time. When I give the question, I want you to shout as loud as you can. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Ready? What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Shall I partake together? You all passed the test. If you would please take the cup you're holding in your hand, put it in the chair in front of you. <coughs> or if you want to take it home as a keepsake. Then we're going to receive here in just a moment the benevolent offering. The purpose of benevolent offering is that we might help those in our midst and our congregation who have some needs, and perhaps even outside of our church we help. Amen? Okay, Toby, would you pray for the benevolent offering, please?
Okay, second quiz before we go today. Gentlemen, you may go ahead. I'm going to give you a question, and the answer is there's power in the blood. Okay? Would you be free from the burden of sin? I couldn't hear you. I can't hear you. You're supposed to be waking the angels up. They're sleeping today. There's power in the blood! Okay, okay you ready? In the wonderful blood of the Lamb. Amen? Amen. Who, what, when, where, why, and how? Amen? Amen? It's all found in that baby Jesus that we just celebrated. We just stand up and praise. I'm going to make you all Pentecostal now, okay? Lift your hands to heaven. Lord Jesus, in praise and adoration, we lift our hands to you, high and holy. Our hands are open wide. We bring nothing to you except ourselves. We present ourselves to you right now without reservation, without restraint. We want you to have all of us, Lord Jesus, as much as you can possibly have. We give it to you. Thank you for these dear ones, Lord, who have taken the time to come today. We come, Jesus, to bring honor and glory to your name. And I pray if I've done anything at all today, Lord, that has not done that, would you please wipe it out of our memories right now? But all that has, Lord, would you keep it there? By your Spirit's power and enabling, would you bring it to mind to them this week sometime? May we stay so focused on Christ this week, we will be a transformed and changed people. Recognizing, as we just said, there is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Dismiss us now with your blessing, we pray in Christ's name. And all God's good children shouted. Amen. And they all shouted. Amen. And they all shouted. Amen. You are dismissed. Go in peace. Thank <laughs> you.